the two swords doctrine is a recovery of the true understanding of church and state in that the church that the idea of church and state is really a clericalist corruption of that phrase there should we shouldn't be talking about church and state because the church is actually um cler lay and clerical it's not just the clerics and this is one of the problems with that conception let me just read you a quote that's in my book <clears throat> which is which which breaks down this uh this distinction between uh the two things the two swords the two swords are in fact the lay order which wields the temporal sword and the clerical order which wields the spiritual sword and they're actually both the church and so when we talk about government we're talking about the temporal sword but it's part of the church at the same time so this is a quote from Stephen of Tournay uh, who died in 1203. He says this. So this, he's talking about Christendom here. In the same city, under the same king, there are two people and two authorities. The city is the church. The king is Christ. The two people are the clergy and the laity. And the two authorities are the priesthood and the monarchy. And so this is the conception of, of Christendom that the church is is this one body so i think that one of the problems that i i find with libertarian conceptions is that there is sort of a a, a universal negative view of state power um and now kennedy is this just just the modern state because it seems like yeah, i mean we all agree the modern state is a, a train wreck uh is there some sort of positive view from the libertarian side of the state well, sure. The first thing we should do is we should define what a state is. Um, it's kind of like when we talk about the church, like what is the church? We're like, oh, it's the one holy Catholic apostolic. And that's not that's not actually what the church is. Those are marks of the church. So um, what is the church? It's the mystical body of Christ. It's full stop. That's ontologically what the thing is. So that's why you can have the church here. You can have the church in purgatory and you have the church in heaven. <laughs> Different modes, let's say, if that makes sense, but still the church. Okay. Um, so what is the state? Well, the state, I mean, the best definition I can find of what the state is, not because it's not the nation, right? Because you can have a nation of people within a state. Um, you could have a nation of people in multiple states. Um, a nation, in, in a sense, they pre precede states, sort of. Uh, so I would say the state is the government. That's basically what it is. I mean, you know, what if, if you had to say, where is the state? You'd look and say, it's, it's those guys. It's the government. That's basically what it is. Because... Uh, it's natural too, some sort of state. It's, there's libertarians don't deny that whatsoever. Um, so anyway, what is the state? The state is the government. <clears throat> so I'm not anti-government uh, in the sense that there will always have to be some sort of person whose job it is is to think about civic affairs. That's that's totally reasonable. That's that's in Mises. That's in Rothbard. That's in all those. That's in the most. Let's call them radical. Uh, you know, I'm idealistic uh, libertarians possible they all acknowledge that there's some sort of necessity for some sort of governance which would mean some sort of state um when you read you know it's funny there's a there's a book called for a new liberty which is by Murray rothbard emory rothbard had again some moral issues he he was uh, apathetic towards abortion for example um, but even there when he talked about abortion he said the catholic position is not unserious if it is murder then it's just obviously wrong he just wasn't convinced at the time of the science that's all um, so he, in his introduction to his book, it's funny, uh, he didn't write the introduction. I think it was written by Lou Rockwell, I think, in the, at least the version I've read. And, um, you know, he's, he, they, they, they criticize what happened to government starting in the 1500s. That's where they actually start their criticism. That's the, the, the interesting thing about libertarianism. I criticize what started happening to government in the 1500s because I do too. Just, exactly. <laughs> so when you talk about the church and the state, the separation of church and state was completely it's a reaction to a it was an overreaction to a extreme which was yeah. the anglican the church is the state not in a just not in a sense of what you were describing as distinction should, without separation exactly it, so that. the church was the state the state was the church meaning um they the state wielded all eternal authority over the people in a very improper way that was wrong that's anglicanism that's the king is the pope and so on and so forth right 
So they reacted to that and they said, well, that's wrong. So a lot of time you'll find, for example, I really love a book by Bastiat called The Law. Many people have probably read it uh, if, if they're into this stuff. It's I, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, again, he did die a faithful Catholic and um, he's buried, buried in Rome in a Catholic cemetery. But um, he, in the one part that will make you cringe a bit in his book is he has this wonderful treatise on why the revolutionary state was wrong. He's, he's, he's writing this in 1850. He's reacting to Robespierrean uh, things, basically, and saying, this is just terrible. This is wrong. What are they doing? This, you know, overreach. And he calls it plunder, the idea of income tax and so forth. And the one thing that'll make you cringe, though, he says, let's try our state without these, like, public education, all these things that we think the state should not do. And he says, and without your state churches. Now, what does he mean by state church? Well, he means... He's talking about the state church under the revolution because the state church under the revolution became a tool of the state, as we saw in England and places like that, and to an extent, places like Russia. Okay, so I'm not anti-state if what you mean is there is a government. And also to even to cite Rothbard, and the reason I cite him is because he's the most radical. So I want people to see, I want to use the strongest, you know, I'm not saying like some wishy-washy guy who's a trad who has libertarian principles. He's an actual full-on, like he wrote the Libertarian Manifesto. So they, they go to the horse's mouth. And um, I was reading an article yet a couple of days ago because I had never actually looked up what the Libertarians thought about the death penalty because there's no more, there's no stronger uh, power of the state doctrine par excellence than the death penalty. If the, if the state can kill you, they can, they have some authority. <laughs> and um, they're pro-death penalty, 100%. Uh, it's a matter of justice. So... Uh, as far as the basic concerns of, of what a government is, no, no problem. That's that's the only way you could in, that's the only way you could enforce sins against you. That's the only way you could enforce prohibitions against theft and murder would to have be would to uh, to be to have some sort of authority to do so. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me go further into this then into the deeper concept, and that is in in. Um, Let's see. Chapter nine of my book is called King of Kings, and it's how Christ is set up as king of kings, literally, in all these different countries and how there's a universal consensus among the saints that when they convert a nation, they do literal violence against the demonic idols, which the state had set up. They destroy them and then they put they build a cathedral on their ruins. And the first big the birth big big nation to do this was Armenia, but it happens everywhere and it's universally done from Ethiopia to Armenia to Ireland uh, to the West in Spain. It's all over the place. So there's this this universal. There's even a story in my book about um, this. Uh, Arabic monk who goes into modern Iran, who's doing the same thing in the East. So it, it seems to be a universal instinct consensus of the, of the faithful to set up the public throne of Christ, wherein the king or monarch or what have you, then pays public homage to the king of kings. And this is from St. Thomas. Uh, Summa Secunda Secunda question 85, article one. He says that at all times and among all nations, there has always been the offering of sacrifices and consequently the offering of sacrifice is of natural law, meaning there is a public religious ritual. So the conception of John Courtney Murray in modern times that we, we can set up the state according to natural law, but without a public religious ritual it's actually itself against natural law, according to St. Thomas. And so instead, you have in our modern period, what I call in the book, anti-culture, which is where, which is a totally new thing known to man. There's never been these nation states set up without this public ritual to a deity, to the divine, which establishes their rule until the American Revolution and the French Revolution and all these other revolutions. And now today we have all these secular states, which are actually not even a culture based on the basic not even a pagan definition of culture and so i see that the libertarian mindset is is in favor of this sort of thing of a secularized state they have this concept of the state which does not seem to be coming from catholic tradition and even plato and aristotle um but they're reducing the state as much as possible to the most basic things like 
preventing murder, preventing theft, but they will not allow the state to pay homage to the king of kings. What say you? Two things. First, there's not a there's no libertarian magisterium, so there's no uh, there's no uh, unified body of belief that one has to believe in order to be a libertarian on that question. Um, so, for example, a major libertarian, well, I don't know if he calls himself it, but he writes for LewRockwell.com, so that's kind of like the libertarian website par excellence, um, is Dr. Dillsaver. You've probably heard of him. Um, he wrote a book called Crucial Christianity, uh, Celebrating God-Given Gender. He's an amazingly faithful man, a wonderful Catholic, and um, he he calls the state the, state the satanic state in his book today, because it is today. Anyway. Um, I, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and actually he has, uh, you should, we, we should get him on. I'm, um, he's a friend of Mike church. Um, in, in crucial Christianity, he argues that the new Christendom actually has to be in a sense, bishopless, not like without bishops in the church, but he means, uh, it's the third millennium. It's, it, you know, every time in history you see almost, you see Christendom establishing itself in a way that's contextually possible at that time. And, uh, the spirit of our age is just too much corruption, too much statism, too much awfulness. So he says, providentially, God has set us up with, with access to to um, all do magisterial documents that the layperson can become catechized, almost despite his bishop, and despite his. So That's it's a very, yeah. it's a very interesting thing, and despite the state, you know, I mean, um, anyway. So uh, as far as public religion, uh, so okay, libertarianism ultimately is the way I describe it is a methodology. It's not an ideology. That's a difference. Um, so it's a it's a set of principles to restrict the worst bits of man when he governs. That's the way I look at it. So we have we, we forget, for example, as Catholics, there was a time when monarchy was pre-Christian, but monarchy is a methodology of governance. And then you can apply it in a lot of different ways. A lot of people will call themselves monarchists. You'd be a Muslim monarchist. You'd be a old pagan monarchist. You could be a Catholic. You could be a Protestant. So, of course, monarchy per se is not one unified body of thing. Libertarianism is not is not unlike that in a sense. Uh, although it's more specific on how governance should actually happen, I believe. Anyway, so as far as the religious question, amongst the, again, Mises and Rothbard stuff, they were not Catholics. And I'm not pretending that they were. Um, their, their perception of church and state so-called being separated, uh, it, it contained no, dis, it contained no definition of what religion they believed to be good or bad. So the methodology was <clears throat> in the revolutionary state that we live in, that, um, that there should be, that the churches should be free from the influence of the state in our modern day, which to be honest right now, I agree with in Canada. I mean, the, 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 I wish the church would just be left alone by the state right now because the state is from the pit of hell. Um, <clears throat> as far as who could be religious or who could require anything of anyone, there was no, there's no prohibition against that libertarianism because here's the thing we were talking about it on the telegram, for example, um, the model of the papal states would not be unlibertarian in the sense that the church actually owned property and governed places that wouldn't, I mean, if you own the property and you govern the place, that's your prerogative. Um, so <clears throat> as far as how you would set up public religion in uh, a libertarian framework, it would be like how you set it up in any society that's ever existed. Even in the most Catholic of places, you know, Charles Coulomb relays a story about blessed Carl and he's walking about and, uh, there were some, his, uh, are they Hasidics in, in Hungary? I think they were Hasidics and they were Jews and they see the emperor coming. They turn their back on him and they start to pray and they start to bob their heads and things and do that, do that thing. And they face East or something, whatever they do. And one of blessed Carl's aides was offended because they turned their back on the emperor. And uh, he said, would you like me to get them to stop? And he said, no, 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 they're praying for me. Now, if I was to get a little too rad trad on my, you know, get like a Reddit traditionalist Catholic comment section. Uh, I would say, was that emperor a modernist when he's, was he promoting some sort of anti-Christic religion? No, he's a Catholic. It's a Catholic state because he's the, because he's the, because he's the king and, and, and it's his religion. Um, but he's tolerant of what they're doing because that's just part of pluralistic human society. And 
He wasn't telling them to go pray to their gods. He wasn't pulling a, an Assisi prayer meeting. It was just something that they were doing. And there was no way to get them to stop without doing things that would be unchristian. This is why in the Spanish uh, Inquisition, <clears throat> excuse me, ironically, what people say is a uh, an overreach of government and state power. It was to it was it was to guard against an overreach of government and state power, which would be what Fal false conversions. We can't have people converting to Christianity involuntarily. This is basic, right? So no matter what kind of Catholic state you live in, there will always be a tolerance of other religions. No matter how Catholic your king is, he will always be king over people who are not Catholic. Uh, unless, I mean, hypothetically, of course, hopefully everyone would convert. But um, so in that case, the public religion uh, of the, especially, and, and again, th thing too is when we start to see these, um, when we see these conversions of nations, let's say, in places like Armenia, et cetera. They're in a, in a sense very fast, but in a sense they're very slow. You know what I mean? By the time Constantine becomes a Christian, we've been battling it out for 300 years. And even then it wasn't like Rome as an as a, as a empire became populated majority Christians for a while, you know? Really, I mean, the, the, the fruition of, of uh, an actual Catholic empire, you don't start to see till Charlemagne. That's about 400 years later. Roughly, I think, right? 800s. So... <clears throat> My point is, is, is um, uh, even how you would apply, the, you know, this state is Catholic. Whatever happens to the people, that's a matter of conversion. And that's been contextual in, the, in, in different ways in the entirety of Christendom. So I think that it's, it's a, you know, there's no, there's no formula on how it has to happen, but this, uh, there's no prohibition against a religious uh, ruler. And when you read through, again, a lot of the, uh, serious libertarians, most of them arrive at a place where a, a monarch would be the best form of government. So I think it would allow for it. Okay. So you're, you are, you're, you're proposing a Catholic, possibly monarch state, which is libertarian. Yes. That'd be my dream. Okay. I think that Chris, so let, let it be known. Kennedy wants a Catholic libertarian monarchy to be okay. And, and, and this is me I'm thinking about. Let's imagine we transported ourselves back to like, what was the golden age of government as Father Dennis Fahey said, basically the area of Thomas Aquinas, the 13th, 13th century. He says that's the golden age of Christendom. What, was, what would government look like in the 1300s or 1200s? Was there a public health official? Were there public schools? I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. Goodness gracious, even the roads were owned by somebody. There was no uh, public road crew. There was property. There were so that, that was the Catholic libertarian state was 1200. What, what I mean is, ironically, if you look at, I mean, what was the law concerned with? Theft, murder, fraud. And then from a religion, and because the people were Catholic, they would, cons the, 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 the church, the, the church always has her spiritual authority, always. But the peoples have to respond to it as again because there's a there's a voluntary aspect to being a Christian because it has to be free. It's not Islam. Uh, so even in a place where you're dealing with like we have to do we have to inquire into heresy, let's say. That's a map to be honest. That can only really happen in a place where people take heresy seriously. You know, I would I still I, the the bishops, for example, let's say of Canada, the bishops have authority, and if they were to stand up against the lockdown the two, two weeks to slow the spread. If they did say we were not going to close our churches, from an institutional perspective, the government, I'm sure they would have backed off. That happened everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world where bishops, even in a secular satanic state, where the bishops stood up and said, we will not comply, the, the government did back off in some manner. Even in Toronto, it was just Cardinal Collins, and he asked for some scraps from the table, and they said, fine, you can have you can have 15% of your cathedrals full, which, in fairness, was 200 people or so because they're big cathedrals. Um. But no one's going to listen to no no none, no one in the culture is going to listen to the bishops right now threatening them with hell because they don't believe in it. So you know anyway again there's the the aspect where people have to be converted. Mm -hmm.